Right, today I'm joined uh, by Chloe Mandel uh, of the Mandel Experiences, uh, working with event organization and hospitality and sponsorship. Uh, she is a climbing native, having worked at the Portland, uh, or sorry, at the Circuit Climbing Gym in Portland. And I imagine the Portland Boulder Rally is kind of a bit of your baby when it comes to events. But on top of that, working lots of other premier regional events in the United States, as well as international events like Seco Block Masters, the X Games, and of course, the Olympic Games uh, in Rio in 2016. Uh, I love talking about events and making competitions sustainable and all that stuff. So I'm so excited to finally have this conversation. Welcome to the conversation. Conversation. Um, right off the bat, my first question, just to get started, is when these competitions like uh, like Prolo or like the Tri State or like um, uh, Come and Send It Fest down at Crux, when they hire somebody like you, what is it that they're expecting to get? What is it that their team of root setters and gym managers and all those people uh, can't do without hiring somebody like yourself? Yeah. Well, first off, thank you, Tyler, for having me. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is awesome. So uh, j jumping right into it, I do join um, various, you know, clients or gyms or teams um, in a variety of capacities. So it honestly depends on what the needs are of that particular event. And kind of, I view myself as like an extension of their team or maybe like a, a mobile events department, say if your particular business doesn't have one. Um, so, you know, with all, a lot of the events you listed, um, I did everything from full event management. So that's, you know, start to finish, even like concept development, strategy, um, kind of why you're doing the event, all the way down to the nitty gritty of logistics, um, you know, finding vendors, uh, you know, a lot of that's kind of the logistics side. But then I kind of view my services in three parts. Um, so there's the event kind of bread and butter, the bulk of the work. Um, sponsorship is another thing. So with several of the events you listed, um, you know, uh, Battle of the Bay, um, Come and Send It, um, I just supported them with getting kind of some extra sponsor support. And actually with Tri-State Bouldering Series, I actually just helped them in getting some extra um, athletes to come because we all know that pro athletes um, have such notoriety and such following that it can really support an event by having more of them there. So, um, so yeah, really, I just kind of have this sort of laundry list of services that is quite a la carte and customizable depending on the needs of the event. How did you get into this? Because my understanding is <laughs> is you were working as a marketing manager for uh, for the circuit climbing gym. Was this kind of a natural extension of getting some experience there or was marketing and, and events kind of your, uh, uh, was that there before you got into working and climbing? Yeah, um, it's a funny evolution actually. So I was working at the circuit bouldering gym um, for quite a while. So yeah, about a decade. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, in that time in 2011, I helped start the Portland Boulder rally in 2013, actually I took it on as the event director. Um, and yeah, that definitely became my favorite part of my job. Um, of course, my other responsibilities included the retail and buying and, you know, just traditional advertising, even, um, you know, rebranding, et cetera. But, um, but yeah, kind of the, the big glamour of a, a big event like the Portland Boulder Rally was definitely just such a highlight that I was, you know, we can all shape our own realities. I'm like, this is all I want to do. Um, that being said, initially, I wasn't as like focused, say, on the climbing industry per se, um, that when I moved on from the circuit, I actually got my feet wet with concerts. So with music um outdoor music festivals. And so kind of bringing that element of, um, I don't want to call it theatrics, but there's so much audiovisual enhancement and kind of a lot that has been developed in the music world that I think we're seeing more and more in, you know, in Adidas Rockstar, in all the latest world championships. So um, it is actually neat to draw from that background. And um, I actually, I, I do many events outside of climbing um, that's kind of not the focus of this particular conversation, but, you know, everything from medical conferences to like women in tech, you know, summits and gatherings. Um, so taking those event industry best practices and applying them to climbing is where I think I've really found this this need. And so little did I know that here's this this random niche that I can fill in the climbing industry, but it's been so much fun. Let's take uh, one of those events where you might considered to be kind of an all, hired as an all rounder. So you're there as the event director, but also having to deal with sponsorship and maybe athlete relations and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
you know, hiring you on um, costs more than just running the event by itself. So typically, I'm sure some of these gyms just budget you into the operations of everything. And other gyms, when they hire you, it requires like an extra step of sponsorship that they have to worry about, or or you kind of have to make it worth the while uh, of them hiring you. They expect more return than what they put in. Uh, I guess the first question is, are you finding gyms are, are still f- chasing after profitability or at least breaking even on some of these events or are a lot of them kind of accepting that um they're taking it as a community builder or something like that yeah oh wow lots of questions there um so absolutely how i put it sometimes is like the event will have to be organized by someone be it me or someone on their staff and usually the staff already have their own jobs (laughs) So like when I was doing the Boulder Rally, for example, that was on top of everything else that I was responsible for when I was working internally with the circuit. And I would attribute the the growth and reputation of the Boulder Rally to the fact that it is run externally by a professional. Um, And I'm not just saying that because it's me. Like you see that kind of across the board when you have a dedicated individual for any one event who's putting that time, that energy, that heart into um, its planning, you're just going to see the results. So, um, yeah, when it comes to uh, the various gyms or businesses that I work with, um, absolutely, when it comes to profitability, it depends on the goals of the event. So if their goal is just to throw a badass party and, you know, certainly everyone obviously is going to keep an eye on the numbers. And especially now, I think that's more important than ever. And we'll get into that later. But um yeah, it ultimately, like, if their goal is to raise money, then we we will have a strategy around that. If their goal is just to have a fabulous event and they, you know, understand the, the basic, you know, value of what, of the services I bring, then that will absolutely be counted for. Um, when it comes to sponsorship and kind of offsetting that, that is one way that, you know, sometimes I never make this promise, but I can pay for myself, right? Just with the relationships I've built um, and, uh it's interesting because, you know, those sponsors, they're they're in it for the value of what they get out of being there. And then um, they trust that, yeah, there is a cost to, to throwing the event. So they know that, that their money is going to go towards making an awesome experience for people because that experience wouldn't be possible if there weren't um, an event organizer. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, it is an interesting cycle. But, um, but, yeah, I'd absolutely work with businesses when it comes to kind of like, great, you know, say their budget is only – X, then, you know, we can work within that with that kind of scalable services. I forgot to mention that kind of third part. So, right, you have um, logistics and event planning, um, sponsorship and marketing. So, right, that's getting kind of butts and seats and um, building a brand around an event, building a a multi-year growth strategy is huge, too. And so um, I can come in in any of those capacities and, again, kind of full service package, um, definitely I think this industry too, as a whole, we're pretty new to formal event production. So um, people just sometimes don't know how much it costs. So a big part of my job is also to educate them and, um, and then provide a strategy. You know, some events don't even come, don't even have a budget, even if they've been going on for a while. So building out that infrastructure so that usually by the time I leave, you have a template for your event that more or less puts me out of a job, but who has 500 extra hours to do that. Right. So, um, so yeah, that's a, it's a lot of value that I can offer. When you uh, are first approached by a client and they're talking about doing some kind of event, what questions do you have for them before you can really know, uh, what it is you're going to do? Um, it, one you mentioned is, is, you know, what is your budget? Are you seeking to make a profit? Uh, what else do you need to know? Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, um, I can share with you my discovery. I call it a discovery form because, um, it does give a really comprehensive overlook of like, Great, you know, when, <laughs> so the who, what, when, why, where, right? right That's the right. usual. Um, some little, some like nuances that I focus on. So I actually kind of have a rating system for clients. So any entrepreneurs feel free to use this or even in, you know, scaling out who you're hanging out, you're hang, you know, spending your time with, but um, right, is it challenging? So will I learn something and will I grow as an individual is actually important to me to the point where, especially with comps, because of my background and strategy and kind of larger vision, usually if there's anything less than a $10,000 cash purse, I'm more likely to consult um, and happy to support the growth of that event. 
but it just doesn't make too much sense. I'm going to have a very hard time getting sponsors. I'm going to have a very hard time getting athletes to a smaller comp. So, um, so yeah, so going back to, is it challenging? Is it kind of, I don't even say big enough because you can have a small event that's still challenging, right? So, um, will I learn, um, is it a good, is it a good collaboration? You can usually tell that pretty easily, right? Is the person responding to your emails? Um, are they, uh, you know, are they answering every question you have, et cetera? Um, it's important because again, it's not my event. It's the client's event. It's the gym's event. So it's very important that they're, you know, in the process. And if they were just be like, here's our event, go have fun. It doesn't work that way, right? Because there's a lot of decisions that need to be made and a lot of direction. So I do view it as a collaboration. Um, going back, is it challenging? Is it a good collaboration? Am I valued? This is just something personal, but um, it is interesting kind of how people express their gratitude and also value comes, you know, part of it's money, but more of it's just like the vibe and you want to work with people that appreciate what you're bringing to them. Um, and then is it fun, right? So that's what I personally look at. Um, as far as the information then logistically that I need to get started, that's just all kind of, again, who, what, when, why, where, but, um, but I really do assess, uh, clients and gyms off of that. Cause just, you know, better, it, it's good that it's a model match that our values align and that I believe in what they're trying to accomplish. You, you mentioned just kind of, uh, that you kind of use prize pool as a gauge of whether or not this may be something that, that is challenging. Um, talk to me a bit about that because we are starting to be able to measure competitions based on a prize pool and it's still pretty small. Um, but what about, you know, we'll, we'll just use the example you use like a $10,000 prize pool. How, how does that help you judge what a competition might be like, uh, just based on that amount going up? Yeah, it's, um, it might not be the, the best measurement. It's the be best one I found so far. Um, again, pre Corona times. So everything we're talking about <laughs> might not even apply. For I'm still living in a fantasy world. So don't yeah, just pretend exactly. it was two months ago. Okay, cool. It sounds good. So, um, yeah, I do find that's kind of the barometer as far as, um, both a gym's commitment towards their own event. I'm not saying, okay, just pony up all the cash. There are strategies we can find that cash. Um, but it, I work best just because of my own vision is around, um, multi-year growth. That's kind of, if it's just a one-off event, there's just so much lost with that, right? We've just built an event template and we've just, um, built a brand, right? Every event is almost like its own little business. And so, you know, it has a budget, it has a mission, it has, um, you know, graphics and, and whatnot. So all that energy put into just one year is a little bit interesting, but, um, but yeah, when it, uh, when it comes to the cash purse, it is, we're well behind the times when it comes to how much money is being given in other sporting events. Um, it's crazy that $10,000 is still the large number, you know, um, you had Seco block at like 20,000. That was just absurd, but in real, you know, in the grand scope of things, it's not really, um, I think it lends obviously, like we talked about a little bit of a legitimacy, you know, kind of also it's gonna, so why even have a cash purse in the first place, right? It's to attract national level competitors to come and hopefully make some of their living off of that. So, uh, depending on who comes really brings some notoriety to your event as well. Um, and then, you know, gets eyeballs on live, on live stream viewers, views too, which can support um, reach and then in turn, you know, sponsor ROI. So there's a lot actually that goes into play. And it's sort of really funny that it is centered around that cash purse. We can go, also go into the pros and cons of live streaming, but there's kind of certain sort of check marks to be a national level kind of big deal event, I guess. And a large cash, cash purse is one of them. Let's, uh, it's was one of my later questions, but let's talk about live streaming. Um, at the moment, do you think for the most part that live streams are earning, uh, money to cover the costs of doing a live stream? Uh, is it currently like worth it in terms of dollars and cents for an event this year, or is it still something that's just an investment for later? Oh man, I was going to write a really engaged 
or a detailed blog article about this. Um, so <laughs> yeah, when it comes to live streaming, um, there is a base cost for a certain caliber of production that I hope isn't that, you know, the client wants, um, cause anyone can live stream. You could live stream mm -hmm. off your phone and then it's like live streamed, you know, but when it comes to the production quality that we're used to, um, there's more to the cost of a live stream than just the video component. So all the lighting and, um, and, you know, flashy lights and, and audio, right. Um, so you have commentators, um, then essentially there's an entire run of show logistically that has to happen, um, overlapping your own events. So you're essentially running two events at once because what's happening on the live stream. So you have commercials, for example, has to be, um, uh, coordinated very closely with what's happening on site. So people aren't climbing when you're in a commercial break. So um, all this is a roundabout answer to, there are many pros and cons of having a live stream. I'm more than happy to talk with anyone. Feel free to reach out. I think right here, there's yeah. my Instagram. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, it cost wise, you there are certain companies providing services at a great value, um, expect to pay I don't know, 10K is kind of that magical number for, for a decent live stream. Um, but there's ways to offset it. There's ways um, to work with vendors on rentals, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, factoring that in, you have to look at your revenue streams, right? So registration, sponsorship, spectatorship, that's an interesting one if we can ever count on that again. But, um, you know, also raffle silent auction, even food and beverage, if you get the proper licensing, um, and merch, so merchandise. So taking all that revenue into account and then looking at what kind of experience you want to create. Um, the nice thing that we're seeing with virtual events is it's showcasing that you can have a much larger audience um, online than in person. So how I think it's important for the events to ask themselves then, how can they take advantage of that? And how can they kind of leverage that huge audience? And if anything, you're seeing 10 times the audience on all the rewatches, right? So say, you know, on a, who, I mean, what are you doing on a Saturday night tuning into something live? Maybe not. It's fine. That's okay. There's an element to live action. I mean, that's why sports is so popular, but, um, but even the rewatches, right? You might have, you know, only 5,000 people tuning in live and then you're going to have 20,000 rewatches. So, um, that's pretty common too. So really as a brand, you have a huge potential to get your message out there. Say if you're a, a new gym or if um, you're providing certain sponsor benefits that can leverage that, then great. By all means, you know, it's, it's awesome. If you think it's going to be so much, say, stress, logistics, um, I always tell people to focus on the cake, right? The cake is your event. And all the icing and all that, if it's going to detract from the cake and you don't have the most like delicious vanilla, perfect, bland, you know, basic cake, then, um, then it's not worth it. So like, don't do a live stream if you don't have a good event already. Um, but yeah, sorry. Lots of roundabout things. Um, with live streaming in general, I'm all for it. I'm an advocate. Um, I think that it does engage a larger community. It also engages potentially a more non-endemic audience, which supports our sport as a whole. So if we can showcase the best of climbing, because that's what comps are, right? Comps are kind of the showy, fun side of like hopefully inspiring people to lead a healthier life, to go out there and take risks. And if we can show that kind of to the world um, and make news and you know, I try and get as much PR and news outlets there so that, yeah, there's this random event happening in your town, but it's a big deal for um, maybe people that have been interested in getting into climbing and now they're inspired. So there's a lot kind of thinking bigger picture. There's a lot we can do with live streams to support the growth of, of climbing. Live streams have a lot of value when you talk about just exposure in general. So, you know, climbers in other parts of the country or in other neighborhoods get to know your event. All those things are understood. Um, but let's say you're, you, you, you've done a live stream for like two or three years at your event and you're about to do it for the fourth year. How, how much weight do you think that has in the deck when you go to prospective sponsors and you say, you know, here are all the benefits of, of you being a sponsor on this? How, 
you know, is the live stream the part that is really convincing them to spend dollars on your event? Or is it still more that they can get their products in a gym? Um, does it does it have the weight yet? Because like the numbers are good, right? So let's say you get 200 spectators at your events, but you get, you know, 500 live, 20,000 after like a week of rewatches. Is that enough to, to, to make it more valuable? Great question. Yeah, I actually ended up um, producing a survey that I handed out at Outdoor Retailer. So that's where, I, you know, it's like had it happened. But it's a great chance to kind of talk to all the outdoor industry all at once, um, sort of a lot of the decision makers. And I handed them a survey and I had them grade what was of all the kind of major sponsor benefits, what was most important to them. And um, it was very interesting to see that like booth, like a on-site presence is absolutely gold. So um, any comp, so listen, if, any um, any event that offers uh, on-site presence, uh, you can be charging for that. Um, it's totally up to your strategy and kind of your relationship with those brands. But um, in the same way where, you know, athletes are trying to standardize sort of how much they're paid based off of what they do for a brand, I really do think that events together, we should work together to create some standard unit for how much different um, benefits cost. And and sponsors know that value and they won't tell you, you know, they'll pay, you know, $3,000 at one event and, you know, 200 at another. And, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, I'm not trying to screw over the brands by any means. And, um, but it's just infor- important for us to be aware of. When it comes to the value of live streams still to sponsors, it's kind of that weird check mark that like it's a very expensive check mark, but it does show that again, you're committed towards the growth, validity, um, kind of scale of the event that you're producing. And live streaming has kind of become one of those like, and I don't say it, don't just do it just to do it, you know, cause it's necessary. But um, it is one of those things that sponsors do look for when you're saying like, I'm trying to do a, a very large event, um, they'll, immediately probably ask if it's live streamed or not. Um, and when it comes to then where that, where they see the value is gets into those creative ideas. So, um, right. Why, why can't you be kind of promoting like online offers? Like it is a space where people are watching online. You have that rare ability to click a link, right? So what can it, what can a live stream offer that actually you can't offer on, on site? So start to think in that way where um, you can actually use that in a more unique and engaging way. When it comes to then the content of the live stream, this is what's important with a multi-year event. And this is what I've done with the Portland Boulder Rally is we've rethought the format entirely. So you'll notice this past year um, with our finals format, it was actually not on site anymore. So these were rehearse folders that um, there was more the storyline of like, can they stick the landing? You know, we saw them in rehearsal they, they topped out on this. Can they do it under this pressure? And, and with um, all these people are watching beta from other um, competitors and do they get confused, et cetera. So it's just an entirely different take on comps. And that's what's going to keep the same walls, right? Same features, unless what we have done actually is built out giant additions to walls. And you're seeing that a lot with comps these days, these mega volumes kind of changing up the space, but still the same wall. It's still potentially the same format unless you switch it up. So I think on two levels, right? Both how can you improve the content for both the viewer and the sponsor, as well as um, rethink, you know, what you're offering kind of on screen. And and that has a lot to do with competition. So that that conversation was kind of talking a bit about the value of an event for sponsors and that the two other spokes would be... um, like the participants and then also the the host uh, for the event being the gym in this context. Um, let's talk a bit about creating value for participants. Um, in climbing competitions, usually there's kind of two or three separate tiers. So you have the, the people you mentioned kind of chasing after those top tier pros that drive viewership and, and add a little bit of gravitas to an event. Um, but then also just the everyday Joes like you and me who are climbers, but we're not trying to get into finals. We're there for a good time or as a spectator. Um, with your experience dealing with a lot of different comps, uh, what do you find are effective ways of creating value for for those different cohorts? 
Yeah, um, it's so interesting. If your event can build a strong enough brand around it, and oftentimes that's going to come maybe from your own gems brand. If you're a gem or like with SecoBlock, right, that's, you know, its own event brand. Um, but if you can build a strong enough, I mean, what is a brand, right? It's It's that feeling. It's that kind of pride. And so what you're doing is you're trying to create loyalty as well as just like a sense of like excitement for something to participate in so that even if you walk away w winning no prizes at all, no goodie bag, no anything, just kind of the bragging rights of having participated in something like that is what you have to offer as organizers. Um, I'm not saying, you know, and it is interesting, like that's why kind of branded merchandise, for example, t-shirts, pint glasses, hats are so popular um, because people really do stand behind your story and what you stand for. Um, uh, you look at these multi-year events and, you know, they have a following. Um, Dark Horse, uh, like I think Tri-State is the most interesting one because uh, it involves competitor gyms, you know, all in under one umbrella. Um, what it's created and, and just with any of these kind of ring of fire, like any of these big comps that you can think of, they're their own brand and people want to be a part of it, right? Your, your own gym, people want to be a member there and there's, some, there's a feeling around that. And if you can relay that story and that brand through kind of every element of what you create, um, it's how a guest or a attendee is welcomed. It's the, the scorecard and how it's branded. It's, um, it's the signage and whether it's clear to get around, right? If there's some consistency and some um, kind of polish to the experience, that alone is providing a wonderful experience. People are in it because they want to not only like, you know, there's the FOMO and like the bragging rights, but they want a really fun and engaging and um, memorable experience. Okay, so that alone, again, that's the cake. So all the frosting, right? You have goodie bags, great opportunity to get, you know, sponsor swag into um, the hands of all the competitors. Um, there's also incentives, say, like a free day pass that comes with registration for to, so you can climb on the problems the next day. Um, always be sure to add a um, expiration if you want to, but um, one, uh, one client I worked with offered a, a discount on punch passes so that they got a little bit of revenue back too. just, you know, you had to come and incentivize people to come to the event to get that discounted uh, membership pass and then um, hang out and grab a beer, watch, you know, watch some climbing. So, um, so yeah, there's lots of ways that I think taking a step back that you can create value kind of in that trifecta. So especially with sponsorship, you're seeing, especially nowadays, a banner on a wall, while important, just to like showcase that a sponsor was there, a, or like a logo on a poster. It's kind of like, you know, again, the, the necessary things to offer, but sponsors aren't nearly as excited about that as the novelty things that can bring value to that attendee. So you have the sponsor that hopefully what they're providing has a three-way win, right? It helps them, they get some ROI out of it. It helps the organizers and, you know, Maybe they'll get money. Maybe they'll get some press out of it. Um, there's lots of forms of value. And then it also hopefully helps the attendee. So banner, for example, doesn't necessarily help the attendee. However, it does create a, a sense and a feeling and a vibe of like, oh, whoa, there's like these big brands engaged. I feel cool because, you know, Mountain Hardware is here or Prana is here, you name it. So, um, so it is funny about that where like, there's kind of all these subtle things really when it comes to the efficacy or the kind of how well a sponsorship works. I always ask attendees, I'm like, can you name three sponsors that were here? And if they can like off the top of their head, name them, then you did something well as a producer because you put that sponsor front and center. So, um, but yeah, going back to your original question of adding value to the registrants, there's so many fun ways that, um, that you can do that. Um, and I hope, some of those helped. <laughs> so. uh, and then, then the last um, spoke would be value for the host. And I think for the most part, if a gym is putting on an event, they, especially if they've done it a couple of times, they understand what the value is for themselves and they get to make the decision of whether or not it's worth it uh, in their context. But let's say, let's flip it a little bit. Um, 
I spent some time working for our, uh, like the equivalent of like a, a USAC region, right? Where it's our job to get gyms to host events for us. Um, how in a situation like that, how would you go about trying to create this value for a host facility that, you know, might not be doing it every single year? You're looking for them to host an event for you of people that are coming from out of town and may not be lifelong customers. Um, what are some ways that you can convince them to, to, you know, close down, do a bunch of route setting, open up for a bunch of people that might not respect their facility as much as their usual members do. Um, how do you make that uh, lucrative or, or at least create an incentive for it? Yeah, um, great question. I'll go in two parts. Um, I actually did exactly that where I approached when outdoor retailer, right, um, would host Seco Block as kind of the big climbing after party. So um, when Outdoor Retailer moved from Salt Lake City to Denver, there was kind of a big gap and a big kind of void to be filled um, with that big climber after party, what people kind of enjoy and are seeking and, and if anything expect. So with that knowledge, having run Seco Block, I approached LCAP and, and Earthtrex Englewood specifically being one of the largest, right, the largest climbing gym as of now um, in the country. And so I was like, hey, you know, we should definitely do a big um, comp or party or however you envision that. Um, and they had actually been thinking of the same thing. So they're like, awesome, you know, it became a great collaboration. And we produced what we called The Hang. So um, totally different format. Actually, uh, thank you, Stephen Jeffrey. I, um, I took the format from the Prolo. So um, that ha had helped produce at Momentum. And, um, it was just, it was a totally different in that there was no qualifiers, no nothing. It's just, uh, the first three people to send a, a climb would get a little ticket at the top, which they could redeem for a prize. So totally different format. Um, but if a climb is really hard, not everyone's going to make it to the top and you can kind of whittle out, uh, grades by that. But in any case, um, we had, it was filled to capacity within the first hour. And then we had another, I would say almost 500 people waiting outside to get in. Um, so that was nuts. I mean, talk about fire marshal safety and everything. It was unexpected, but really cool that you see this demand. Um, and yes, certainly there were complaints that were fielded by regulars that were like, why do I have to, you know, not be able to climb right now? Cause the gym is technically closed, um, for this event. But I think the, the benefits way outweighed it. I mean, we had Alex Honnold there signing posters, Lynn Hill, um, kind of the who's who of the, the bouldering world, um, competing, um, Alex Pucci, Nina Williams. Um, I mean, yeah, you uh, yeah. Nathaniel Coleman, like it was just, it was really exciting. So, um, people want to see their stars. And I think depending on where you are in the country, people, um, regular members, they see them online or see them in videos, but don't often have access to these kind of big names in climbing that a comp can bring. Um, so Portland is definitely one of those, right? Um, Lisa Chulich, shout out, is uh, is definitely is a local, but she's kind of our hometown hero. Other than that, um, you know, Peter Dixon used to be in Portland, but uh, we don't have many pros that come through. So it's really exciting when when they do come for the comp. Um, that being said, I'm usually not the one to convince a gym to host a comp. That was a very specific situation with Earthtrex. Um, usually, you know, if you're not seeing the value, then that's okay. And you know, there are other ways to meet your marketing or end goals. Um, it is very hard to, if I would be a bajillionaire, if I could um, calculate the exact ROI of an event, um, you know, because say so-and-so, their friend went to a comp and then they saw a picture and they're like, oh, I want to try climbing. I mean, you just, you, you don't know where those dollars are coming from and what the real impact of your event is. My hope is that... Um, kind of from a bigger picture as an industry that we do view the events we put on as a window into our sport. And, um, and especially if there's a live stream or if there's a lot of press around it, I would hope that that's the highest quality possible in the same way that IFSC has really been upping its game kind of production wise with its events um, to showcase kind of the best of climbing. I mean, we're an Olympic sport now and that should be reflected in our events, kind of the very external facing way of, of what that sport is. Um, 
again, Adidas Rockstars is like my kind of uh, bar for, for what that can look like, but um, it's maybe not a, as traditional of a, of a format kind of you might find with USAC, et cetera. So let's, let's go on a tangent really quick. Um, let's yeah. talk about Adidas Rockstars, one of the few competitions that has a huge multinational sponsor attached right to the title. Um, one thing about it is it it does have a really peculiar format and um, it's not the kind of format necessarily that ensures that the best climber gets like wins, right? It is a little bit of a novelty format. A lot of like the qualifiers and all that stuff have a lot of integrity. Um, so a question I'm always confronting because I just like thinking about formats is, you know, how much has to be a gimmick? Hopefully 0%. But there has to be, you know, some kind of game. Anyway, uh, do you have any, um, I guess the question is, what's it going to take to to get more events rolling with sponsors like Adidas? Um, does it require an entirely different format? Like what what is the strength of Adidas Rockstars that gives it this opportunity? Yeah, I can't speak to that specific event because I haven't been involved um, internally. I am just a fan, so mm -hmm. if anyone's watching, hit me up. But um, yeah, so uh, you asked two questions. Number one, your your beginning part about um, gimmicky and kind of that showmanship around climbing and comps these days. That's been talked about so much. There's been plenty of articles around it. Um, I will say the athletes are really pushing the route setters to create um, terrain that is challenging um, and not just showy. Um, you know, Seco Block just became a speed comp more than anything. Uh, but in any case, um, so so there is that going that conversation going on. I mean, even with the the challenging challenging decision that the IFSC had in picking a a format to include all three disciplines, you know, can you call that the best like climbing? Maybe it actually is 100%, the best. No, I hate it. But anyway, that's my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe it is the best all around climber because they're doing all three disciplines the best. I mean there's, we can debate that for, for days. Um, I think again, it goes back to the very heart of like, what are you trying to accomplish? And then tying in the sponsor side is, um, when you start to deal with, with non-endemic sponsors, um, so endemic meaning climbing, non-endemic meaning outside of the climbing industry, um, there is kind of a different, not different language. There's just a more refined sales cycle that needs to happen. Um, and there's a lot of information about that in like, if, if you're interested in learning about this, literally read like a sales book. So like selling to big companies is, um, is one of them that I just, you know, dived into, but, um, it, that understanding kind of the business angle of why a larger corporation would be interested in us and don't, and definitely don't like think of climbing as like this small thing you know we have power there's you know seven million climbers out there or something crazy like that in the u.s and it's only growing and we'll see you know what happens but i think definitely always believe in ourselves as a sport and take those risks you know i've brought in super corporate into events that i've worked with for example um you know, Adidas is kind of that funny crossover one because ever since they purchased 510 and came out with the Adidas Terex brand, you know, they are seeing the value in the outdoor industry. I wonder if you're going to start to see that from more brands, especially now we're seeing the importance of the outdoors and hopefully that only grows. But um, it's finding that angle and you, what you're doing is you're creating what's called a value proposition um, to your, it's not about you. <laughs> it's actually about the sponsor. So addressing the sponsor's need through your event is the baseline of how you're going to kind of hook that big fish, so to speak. Um, and so, yeah, relationships are super important. You know, outdoor retailer is great because you get to like face to face meet those people. So I'll go to like the International Auto Show because like then you're meeting face to face kind of some some big name um, people in the auto industry, you know, thinking about what industries have that crossover and kind of making that argument where it's like, well, every climber has got to have insurance. You know, every climber has a car. Every climber might have a bank. You know, it's like once you can find that link and it's definitely been something I've been trying to do of like 
great, here's an industry kind of like untapped that is really hard to market to. And we're incredibly, you know, loyal once we do have a brand, like you will buy the same rope, I'm sure from the same company forever. Um, same thing with climbing shoes. Once you find the ones that fit, like it game on. So I think, you know, car companies are an easy one, but yeah, I've definitely been exploring kind of who is, where does it like seemingly you're like, Oh, that makes no sense. But then kind of the more you look into it, um, it actually can serve them. And I think companies are really looking to differentiate themselves and we're kind of that fun, cool, hip way to do it. I mean, look, we were one of five sports that got the made into the Olympics because of that very fact. So I think leveraging that is super crucial and figuring out again, how you can serve a brand and not necessarily yourself to make that case is going to be crucial in that exploration and sales. <laughs> Uh, in your job, I imagine you've uh, just doing a little bit of research. You've experiences are obviously important to you. It's in the name of your company, and I think just in your personal values, I think you've you've expressed um, that uh, important moments in life are something that you kind of chase after and that you want to provide for people. Um, so my question is: Are there any particular just those big ones in your head, looking out over the last uh, you know five years with this company, but longer? in the, in the general industry. Uh, what are the ones that really stick out where, I don't know if you got like a, a, a thank you letter or you saw somebody's reaction or you just felt super proud about like how you did one little thing. Like what, uh, give me, give me something that just really you're exceptionally proud of over this career so far. Oh my, well, thank you. Um, oh God, I, I'm like grateful that there are so many, um, you know, I, I will say an event has an Instagram, um, or even if it doesn't have like an Instagram handle, maybe it has a hashtag. I do read through all those posts, you know, and it's amazing. All I can say about hosting events, you have no idea where people are coming from or the impact you're making. Um, there, there are people who have gone through major surgeries or had major health complications that then climb at your comp. And that's something that they have been training for and kind of like, it's gotten them through the hardest of times. Like it's the reason they might be living right now. And I don't say that lightly. Um, so, I mean, I get goosebumps every time I think about it, but, um, but it's, it's for each individual that you're making a difference in. So again, no matter, I'm talking about big events, but no matter the scale of your event, people, it does make a difference in their lives. And that's really what it comes down to. Right. You're just trying to give them the best possible experience. So um, for me personally, I mean, I'll admit, like seeing the opening ceremonies in, in Rio was was absolutely amazing. Um, it was, I, I, I to be super clear, it wasn't my company that was hired on. It was Chloe Mandel, myself as an individual, um, hired on as a hospitality manager for Cisco Systems, one of the sponsors for... Um, the event. And so our job was kind of, you know, handholding more or less, but, um, providing a really, uh, beautiful experience for the top executives of that company that spent bajillions of dollars to be there. And so, um, as a result, you know, we'd seat all the guests to their seats, but then we would also be seated in these stadiums and just the, I mean, I'm going to miss it so much, right? The crowds, when you have 60,000 people <laughs> in a stadium cheering and, um, and see the Olympic rings. I mean, I know the Olympics, they've built such a brand around that. And I think they're doing their best to maintain that kind of that emotion and that strong, um, uh, inspiration around it. Um, it, it's like nothing you've ever felt. So, you know, it's, I can, every time I watch, um, an athlete, for example, uh, qualify. So when Alana Yip qualified as the Pan Americans, I was crying watching that online because I know yeah, what you're yeah. feeling. You know, it is a big deal, and um, it's been funny on my own journey because, like, this road to Tokyo, I'm kind of having that same experience, but on the back end, right? I'm trying to make it to Tokyo as well, just as a producer, not as an athlete. So um, it is pretty funny, but but yeah, there's a couple examples. 
I try to be critical of the Olympic Games, but I, you know, you can't help it, unfortunately, with some of these things. It does just like just watching YouTube replays of like the London 2012 opening ceremonies just like knocks you out. Um, so that sounded like a perfect question to end this interview, but it's totally not. I just want to like move a little bit outside of the competition world just to some things that are kind of adjacent. Um, you talked about uh, being a hospitality manager for really big brands uh, and just, you know, the entire event thing is uh, is just creating experiences and, and communication with people and all that kind of stuff but i want to take it back to when you were working you know some some desk shifts at at the circuit uh, uh bouldering gym do you have any uh criticisms or advice for the climbing industry in general about how we deal with basic everyday customer interactions like are there things where you really feel like we could be doing much better oh wow um i don't know if i'm the right person to be asking i mean it's all anecdotal um i think there's that the, I can break it down. Like if you were to put gyms into two, to, this is just from my own head. So forgive me, you guys. But if you were to break down gyms into kind of two categories, you have like kind of that mom and pop, like organic, like it's okay that not everything's clean, you know, kind of feel. Um, and then you have the like, and I, I'm talking about extremes here. So then you have the like sterile kind of mick gym feel um and so right those are those are the polar opposites so imagine we have kind of a spectrum and it's a matter of blending that so how do you create that kind of like personal connection where i mean back in the heyday of the circuit you know people would just hang out even after we were closed and we'd throw out movies on uh, so uh, you were talking about the two extremes of those big sterile gyms, the small mom and pop ones. Uh, do you want to keep going from there with your point? Yeah, no. Well, just to answer your question and kind of my thoughts around it, right? It's how do you create the the perfect medium of that? Or how do you create kind of the things people love around um, that, you know, kind of homey, unregulated feel? And then the... Um, the really polished kind of like professional, you know, this is a business feel. And there's definitely pros and cons of both. I mean, I, we're, it's still a business. Um, I think more than ever, gyms are gonna have to show, you know, psychologically that they are the cleanest space ever. So, you know, that's gonna have to evolve. But um, in any case, when it comes to just like front desk folk, you know, memorizing names is actually something that I would challenge myself with. Um, and I knew hundreds of names by the time that I left the circuit, um, just like by sight immediately. And that's a skill I still use. So know that there's a lot of transferable skills, even as a front desk person. Um, and, you know, I think gyms, it's, it's so funny. It's all about like perception and brand and balance. So that's a whole other conversation. But um, how do you create that sense of a belonging and a sense of connection in a way that still creates kind of some trust that you're making improvements and that you're, you know, offering a really solid value for their dollar too. So. Cool. cool. Um, within your industry, is there talk right now about, you know, there's lots of different roadmaps of how this might play out this current, how I, just in case people are watching this, like, you know, 20 years in the future, for some reason, everybody's like scared of COVID-19 right now. So that's the context. Um, this might last a few months. It might last a few years. Probably it's going to be a long, slow, gradual decline and, and will change as we go. But, uh, from, from the event side, I imagine in your industry, there's probably talk about like, is, is there a, a, a reduced pool of sponsorship available? Like, do companies have the money with uh, with the economic downturn that's come from this? Um, do gyms have anything to offer sponsors if they can't, you know, fit 300 people in the door? Um, so what, uh, what are you hearing from the people in your industry? What's the wisdom like right now? Is there a lot of fear or is it still kind of a, you know, let's, let's see how it goes. It might not be as bad as we think. Yeah, great question. Um, a lot of Facebook groups for the event industry for event professionals popped up uh, right when all the events were being canceled. So we were kind of the industry that was most visibly hit um, right in the beginning because we literally bring people together. So um, so there was that. And I think it's been a lot of learning together 
Um, luckily as event professionals, we're so used to chaos and uncertainty. You know, if you can manage a 20,000 person evacuation during a flash flood and lightning storm, you know, <laughs> and, it, and that I actually had to do in X Games and actually in Seek of Black for those 3,000 people. But in any case, like if you can do that, like this, it's like, okay, cool. You know, Murphy's Law, like what else is going to go wrong? So, um, there's a lot of guidelines being kind of shared and um, nothing concrete because it's changing all the time. Um, I think the United States is an interesting example because it's going to vary state by state. Um, I really appreciate uh, what the survey that USA Climbing put out um, to kind of get a pulse on the comfort level of its members and how far are people willing to travel for competitions. Um, what, uh, you know, what kind of accommodations would they be comfortable with? Um, you know, really, if you look at the decision factors for attendees and what events they're going to attend in the future, it comes down to kind of the size of the event. I think, you know, more people, the more risk, um, distance to travel. So whether you have to hop in a car or get in a plane is going to really make a difference. Um, the total cost, like I definitely want to acknowledge the economic impact on each individual and whether they can even afford to come to events now. Um, and then the location itself, right? Is it a hotbed of Corona or is it kind of, um, a little bit more, uh, l lower risk. So those kind of four things are going to be huge. I, I implore the USAC to kind of publicize the results of that survey because I'm fascinated, but, um, but when it comes to sponsorship, just what I'm seeing right now. And probably if you talk to a lot of event professionals, they're seeing this. Um, budgets are pretty frozen at the moment. Um, so my thought initially when this happened, I was like, oh, all these events are canceling. Where do those sponsorship dollars go? You know, are they just sort of up for grabs? And, you know, um, it wasn't appropriate to ask for say, but I, I kind of pinged some really, you know, close contacts in the sponsor world that I felt comfortable asking. Um, you know, you're seeing a huge nosedive in retail. So that's going to affect a lot of those brands that are product based. Um, and so they're most likely going to repurpose those dollars to keep <laughs> their own businesses afloat. But um, what you are seeing is a lot of initiatives to support um, the industry as a whole, right? Because if every, if, if say, you know, even X percent of gyms, so say even, you know, 20% of gyms close, that's 20% less sales, say, um, that, you know, whole companies do or that um, retailers might stock uh, in their retail shops. So um, it is in the best interest of, of all the yeah, uh, climbing industry um, brands that, you know, the gyms do do well. So, for example, I've been working with some financial assistance um, initiatives through the Climbing Wall Association and helping build out strategies and, and funding for that. Um, and you are seeing brands kind of get behind that, you know, they see the value in, in supporting their, um, their industry. Um, when it comes to, uh, the future, I know that there is going to be, um, I haven't had to negotiate say contracts with sponsors for anything into the future. Um, so it is interesting, the sponsors that committed to the, say like my fall events, um, I'm just kind of putting those on pause till we even know if those events are happening. So um, it's an interesting time. This is why it's super valuable to have sponsor contracts, you guys. <laughs> if you don't already have anything in writing, it's just a nice safety measure. Granted, I like to have a strong enough relationship where you know the contract is just a reflection of what we agree upon as humans. But um, but yeah, it's it's a tricky one with sponsorship. Um, I. I also don't feel you can charge the same amount with a scaled back event. Um, so say sponsors were expecting 2000 people on site and you can only have 500 or maybe due to regulations, you can only have 50. That's going to be a very different um, cost for the sponsor. However, are there ways that you can make that up virtually? So that's where I've been doing the bulk of my research lately is in what um, digital options are available, what's really creative, you know, that's not just, again, that provides value to the attendee. It's not just a logo, right? It's something more. So I think, um, get creative and brainstorm and think kind of, I like to take an inventory. That's what I call it. Like a value inventory of, um, all that you have to offer social media, what platforms, um, and what are ways that again, can bring value to that sponsor and to the attendee. 
Uh, I think I, in a few months, I'd like to have you back just to talk about how things have evolved. Um, because yeah. I don't want, I've, I've, a lot of people have been very skeptical to like speculate, which is completely reasonable right now because we really don't know what's coming next. So we'll talk more about that uh, later. My final area of questioning though is something I didn't know until you shared it with me was uh, compcalendar.com, uh -huh. uh, which is something you've put together, which the idea is to just have a comprehensive list. I think you're starting with kind of the United States, at least for, and obviously this kind of stuff is, indefinitely on pause for now until we figure out what's going on, but have a directory where people can see what's going on, when it's happening, great details like prize pool and what kind of uh, event it is uh, in terms of like discipline. Um, it's not it's not a new idea. A lot of people have tried it, but it is a, an idea that's really fundamental to a competitive sport, um, aside from having marketing benefits, is just like people understanding what's going on. And if you want to become a semi-pro climber, it definitely helps to have a resource that lets you see what's going on. And if you're a voracious climbing spectator, having a TV guide for this stuff, because at the moment we don't really, you have to be following the right person on Facebook to get the link, or you got to, you know, Canadian Climbing News on Instagram. It's like, trying to help people out with that kind of stuff. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts about why you decided uh, to do this, but also um, as as you may continue working on it in the future, um, your, your, your thoughts and strategies about like how a platform like that would work and how you make sure it is comprehensive. How are you involving the host gyms and making sure the community is visiting this website? Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, thanks. Um, yeah. So Comp Calendar, I started a few years back. And um, I actually did it out of necessity because I would have gyms ask me when they should host their comps. And I literally had to go to like a million different sites, call up other gyms. Um, it would also happen. This is the nice thing about and if you're um, having an annual event, you can kind of claim rights to that one date. So, um, so having some consistency there, if you don't kind of bounce around too much um, is nice for the world, but um, yeah, people would call me up and be like, Hey, when's the Boulder rally? We want to make sure not to schedule on that same date. Cause they know that they'll, they won't get the same pros there per se. Um, you know, have, there's just only a finite amount of, of pro athletes. That's kind of the, the smallest group to, to, um, unfortunately fight for, but, um, and even sponsorship dollars like going really big. Are you going to have like the marketing manager of, you know, North face can only be in one place at a time if it's big enough. So in any case, um, point is with comp calendar. Yeah. It started out kind of by necessity. Um, but I did view it as a, as a service. It's always been free. Um, it is uh, user generated content. So I, um, have done my best to promote it directly to gyms. Um, it's a little hard to fill out the forms if you're not the organizer, cause I do ask for very specific information, um, that so that it can be kind of a one stop, uh, shop for like great direct link to registration site. Um, there's some stats out there that you lose about 50% of your audience every time you have to click. So, um, it's nice if you have a direct link to like register and that only serves the events. So it's basically like free marketing for the comps. Um, and then in turn, I get to know what's out there just to kind of keep a, a pulse on the, the situation, but, or the, the industry. Um, but yeah, it's serving kind of three general audiences. So you have the organizers, right? So they know when to pick a date. Um, you have the competitors, just like you mentioned, um, so that they can also uh, know what's going on. Sponsors also kind of love it too. Um, and then the live stream viewers. So you can actually, I've created a filter so that you can see which um, comps are live streamed or not. There's tons of filters. So you can filter by discipline so you're only interested in speed climbing you can find out where the speed comps are um and uh it actually is uh, international now so you can list by country unfortunately it's only in english at the moment um i think once it's all self-funded is the thing so um i haven't taken any sponsorship sponsorship for it yet i, I wanted to kind of proof of concept i wanted to see that it, there was enough interest before i offered that kind of value to any sponsor um, I also like the idea that it's pretty clean. So one of our, um, our, I actually stole this idea from Groupon. <laughs> so if you've ever worked with Groupon before, they don't allow any graphics in their images. So I, I was like, yeah, it keeps Groupon looking super clean. So that's why you have like that massage person and, and their deals. Same thing with Comp Calendar. It's just a photo that best represents your sport, a little tagline or your event. 
a little one-liner that can differentiate you. And then I think Tyler, where this is going to become that much more important is all those comps that got rescheduled. Um, I've, I've been in negotiation with the USAC. I, I see the challenges that, that they're not the ones always hosting these events. So working with the gyms is more my focus. Um, and uh, it's going to become more important than ever because you're going to see all like a year's worth of events potentially smushed into a few months. So we absolutely have to collaborate. I do um, encourage everyone to take advantage of the free resource compcalendar.com. Um, I was surprised when I went and the URL was available. So 10 bucks a, a, a year, <laughs> I think it is. So happy to host it. But yeah, um, I worked with a de developer and a, a designer to kind of create the exact look um, so that it is really user friendly. My hope is that, yeah, you can go on there and just um, everyone can kind of, it all depends though on how many people um, list the events and then hopefully people can find all that's going on but it is on all of us to, to use. And I'll, I'll do my best to kind of follow up with gyms and something because it's so, such a side project. I probably could do a better job of like tracking down the comps and getting them on there. I don't want to be the one to list them because I do think it has to come from from people seeing that value. But um, but it's super easy for me to just duplicate an event year after year. So that once it's in there one year, you just tell me it's going on again and then boof, yeah, it duplicates. So um, so yeah, I hope it's, it's beneficial to all climbers. Um, it, like I said, it is international. We've had some Canadian comps on there. Uh, yeah, the language barrier will, will be interesting once we move even more international, but people absolutely are tuning in more and more to international events. So I, I mm -hmm. hope they get listed for sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a cool side project to have. And it's, it's like, it's critical infrastructure for this industry that it, I hope, I hope it succeeds. You know, it's something that I hope uh, when we return to, to kind of hopefully some kind of normal calendar. It's something that uh, is a useful tool for everybody. Let's call it there because it's been basically an hour. Um, so th that was a great discussion. You're just a great conversationalist. So thanks for uh, for making some time to chat. Uh, so make sure you visit uh, Chloe Mandel uh, online at mandelexperiences.com. And if you want to reach out to her, I think is Instagram the best way to initiate conversations with you? Yeah, or? that was great. Cool. So up. yeah, hatch, uh, things right on the, t I can't point at anything, but anyway, you can uh, reach her on Instagram. Uh, thank you for watching this. Uh, if you want to support this, you can always uh, donate at the Patreon, or if you're a Discord user, come hang out in the Discord. We're building a small community of people that care about the cost of day passes and climbing competition formats. So uh, if you want to chat about that kind of stuff, come hang out. Otherwise, follow us uh, at Plastic Weekly. Thank you very much, Chloe. And uh, until next yeah. time, uh, we'll see you later.